Hello, welcome to lecture 64 of this series. This series of lectures is based on my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find my book on Amazon at the link below. We are still on chapter 8, and today it's going to be a short lecture on metabolic acidosis in patients with chronic kidney disease. Now, what about the prevalence and what kind of metabolic acidosis should we expect in patients with chronic kidney disease? Well, there was a big study in 1,038 patients with stages 2 through 5 chronic kidney disease, not on dialysis, showed that the prevalence of metabolic acidosis is 7% only in CKD2, but went up to 13% in stage 3 and was up to 40% in stages 4 and 5. Now, patients with chronic kidney disease generally develop non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, normal anion gap or hyperchloremic or mineral acidosis with uh, variable degrees of hyperkalemia once you get to about uh, stage 4, once uh, the uh, GFR is below 20 to 25 percent. Now, once renal function worsens further, once you reach stage 5, GFR now is below 15, now you can have uremic acidosis. You can have an ion gap metabolic acidosis. Therefore, patients with severe chronic kidney disease can have non anion gap metabolic acidosis, that's more usual, but you can have anion gap metabolic acidosis or even both combined. What are the consequences of metabolic acidosis in chronic kidney disease? Well, chronic metabolic acidosis is not good because it is associated with suppression of appetite, so you get hypoalbuminemia, which is associated with poor prognosis, you get impaired glucose tolerance, you got muscle weakness, and metabolic bone disease because this acid has to go somewhere. It goes to the bone and leaches the calcium, so it causes metabolic bone disease. Now, when you have chronic metabolic acidosis, the non-anion gap, you have increased ammonia genesis, so you need to increase the ammonium production to buffer that acid, like we said. But this is not good because it will lead to activation of complement. Once complement is activated, you can have tubular interstitial injury, and you can worsen kidney function. What are the risks of metabolic acidosis in chronic kidney disease patients? Well, if you look at a big study, the SPRINT study, it is a hypertension study, but if you do with like a post hoc analysis like they did here, patients or participants with serum bicarbonate below 22 had increased cardiovascular risk. Now, another study in 1,240 male patients with moderate and advanced non-dialysis chronic kidney disease, they found in that study that the relationship between bicarbonate and mortality was U-shaped, meaning you don't want the bicarb to be too low, but not you don't want it to be too high either. You don't want acidosis, but you don't want alkalosis either. So the lowest mortality was was with the serum bicarbonate in the range of 26 to 29, highest mortality with bicarbonate less than 22. This is kind of reminiscent when, reminiscent when you talk about potassium. Potassium, the best potassium is between 3.5 and, and 5.5. And Low potassium is associated with increased mortality, the same as high potassium. So you want this bicarbonate in the middle. How do we treat patients with metabolic acidosis and chronic kidney disease? Well, when they are at earlier stages, when they don't need dialysis, you give them oral alkali. Usually it's uh, serum bicarbonate. And if uh, they need dialysis, if they're uremic and they need dialysis, then you have to start them on dialysis and then you can easily correct the uh, acidosis. So some studies have shown that if you treat metabolic acidosis with oral alkali, or if you reduce the dietary acid intake by reducing intake of animal protein, you can actually slow the decline of renal uh, function in chronic kidney disease patients. And in all of these slides, I provided adequate references for those people who may be uh, interested. Now, uh, there was a trial that showed that treatment of metabolic acidosis in patients with stages 3 to 5 chronic kidney disease reduced mortality and improved renal survival. So it is recommended to start treatment in patients with chronic kidney disease once you have serum bicarbonate below 22. 
So you give oral sodium bicarbonate and you want to restore bicarbonate to the normal range. So at least 22, preferably around 24. You don't want to make the patient alkalotic either. So you don't want serum bicarbonate above 28, uh, 29. Now, uh, each 650 milligram tablet has about eight equivalents of sodium in it. This is unlikely to raise blood pressure. Again, it's sodium bicarbonate, not sodium chloride. And in the studies I mentioned, uh, blood pressure was not affected. So uh, don't worry about uh, raising uh, blood pressure. Now, how much do you use? I usually start with 650 milligrams twice a day, maybe three times a day with food. No side effects really other than causing gas, okay, because you are giving uh, sodium bicarbonate. Uh, some patients prefer to take baking soda. Baking soda is a sodium bicarbonate. So if they take maybe about one eighth of a teaspoon three times a day, that also uh, will do it. Uh, some dissolve it in water. Again, the taste is not good at all, but some people don't mind. Uh, I prefer to give uh, the tablets. Now, oral sodium bicarbonate improves muscle strength in CKD and prevent metabolic bone disease and catabolic state. In CKD patients, uh, you can also increase the intake of fruits and vegetables. This way you're uh, creating more like alkalosis. You're fighting the acidosis and you can reduce dietary, especially animal protein. And this way you reduce endogenous acid production and this may prevent metabolic acidosis. The problem with this strategy, when you give fruits and vegetables, you can end up with hyperkalemia. Now, fortunately, now we have two new potassium binders, Petermer or Veltasa, also uh, sodium zirconium cyclosilicate or Lokelma. You can use those, but again, you're adding uh, another medicine. Uh, it could bind some, uh, the binder, the potassium binder can bind other medication. The cost is not uh, small by, by any chance. So uh, you have to weigh these uh, benefits and risks for, for every patient. Now, uh, at some point, we had high hopes for a, a product called uh, Viveramir, and it's a non-absorbed oral polymer that selectively binds hydrochloric acid. So it's like a hydrochloric acid uh, binder. And it is under study for uh, patients with CKD and metabolic acidosis. The data was presented to the FDA. The FDA did not approve it uh, at the time of this lecture. Um, and they requested further information. So I'm not sure what will happen to uh, this uh, drug. I'm going to end here. And in the next lecture, we are going to discuss anion gap, high anion gap, metabolic acidosis. See you then.